Chapter 6 My Struggle for an Education One day, while at work in the coal mine, I happened to overhear two miners talking about a great school for colored people somewhere in Virginia. This was the first time that I had ever heard anything about any kind of school or college that was more pretentious than the little colored school in our town. In the darkness of the mine, I noiselessly crept as close as I could to the two men who were talking. I heard one tell the other that not only the school was established for the members of my race, but that opportunities were provided by which poor but worthy students could work out all or a part of the cost of board. And at the same time, he taught some trade or industry. As they went on describing the school, it seemed to me that it must be the greatest place on earth and not even heaven presented more attractions for me at that time than did the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia about which these men were talking. I resolved at once to go to that school. Although I had no idea where it was or how many miles away, or how I was going to reach it, I remembered only that I was on fire constantly with one ambition, and that was to go to Hampton. This thought was with me day and night. In the fall of 1872, I determined to make an effort to get there. Although, as I have stated, I had no definite idea of the direction in which Hampton was, or of what it would cost to go there. I do not think that anyone thoroughly sympathized with me in my ambition to go to Hampton unless it was my mother and she was troubled with a grave fear that I was starting out on a wild goose chase. At any rate, I got only half-hearted consent from her that I might start. The small amount of money that I had earned had been consumed by my stepfather and the remainder of the family, with the exception of a very few dollars, and so I had very little with which to buy clothes and pay my travelling expenses. Finally, the great day came, and I started for Hampton. I had only a small, cheap satchel that contained few articles of clothing I could get. The distance from Malden to Hampton is about 500 miles. I had not been away from home many hours before it began to grow painfully evident that I did not have enough money to pay my fare to Hampton. By walking, begging rides both in wagons and in the cars, in some way after a number of days, I reached the city of Richmond, Virginia, about 82 miles from Hampton. When I reached there, tired, hungry and dirty, it was late in the night. I had not a single acquaintance in the place and being unused to the city ways, I did not know where to go. I applied at several places for lodging, but they all wanted money and that was what I did not have. Knowing nothing else better to do, I walked the streets. In doing this, I passed by many food stands where fried chicken and half-moon apple pies were piled high and made to present a most tempting appearance. At that time, it seemed to me that I would have promised all that I expected to possess in the future to have got hold of one of those chicken legs or one of those pies. But I could not get either of these nor anything else to eat. I must have walked the streets till after midnight. At last, I became so exhausted that I could walk no longer. I was tired. I was hungry. I was everything but not discouraged. Just about the time when I reached extreme physical exhaustion, I came upon a position of a street where the broad sidewalk was considerably elevated. I waited for a few minutes till I was sure that no passers-by could see me and then crept under the sidewalk and lay for the night upon the ground, 
with my satchel of clothing for a pillow. Nearly all night, I could hear the tramp of feet over my head. The next morning, I found myself somewhat refreshed, but I was extremely hungry because it had been a long time since I had sufficient food. As soon as it became light enough for me to see my surroundings, I noticed that I was near a large ship and that this ship seemed to be unloading a cargo of pig iron. I went at once to the vessel and asked the captain to permit me to help unload the vessel in order to get money for food. The captain, a white man who seemed to be kind-hearted, consented. I worked long enough to earn money for my breakfast and it seems to me, as I remember it now, to have been about the best breakfast that I have ever eaten. My work pleased the captain so well that he told me if I desired, I could continue working for a small amount per day. This I was glad to do. I continued working on this vessel for a number of days. In order to economize in every way possible, so as to be sure to reach Hampton in a reasonable time, I continued to sleep under the same sidewalk that gave me shelter the first night I was in Richmond. When I had saved what I considered enough money with which to reach Hampton, I thanked the captain of the vessel for his kindness and started again. Without any unusual occurrence, I reached Hampton with a surplus of exactly 50 cents with which to begin my education. To me, it had been a long, eventful journey. But the first sight of the large three-story brick school building seemed to have rewarded me for all that I had undergone in order to reach the place. It seemed to me to be the largest and the most beautiful building I had ever seen. The sight of it seemed to give me new life. I felt... I felt that a new kind of existence had now begun that life would now have a new meaning. I felt that I had reached the promised land and I resolved to let no obstacle prevent me from putting forth the highest effort to fit myself to accomplish the most good in the world. As soon as possible, after reaching the grounds of the Hampton Institute, I presented myself before the head teacher for assignment to a class. Having been so long without proper food, a bath and change of clothing, I did not, of course, make a very favorable impression upon her. And I could see at once that there were doubts in her head about the wisdom of admitting me as a student. She felt that I was a worthless loafer or tramp for some time. She did not refuse to admit me. Neither did she decide in my favor. I continued to linger about her and to impress her in all the ways I could with my worthiness. After some hours had passed, the head teacher said to me, The adjoining recitation room needs sweeping. Take the broom and sweep it. It occurred to me at once that here was my chance. Never did I receive an order with more delight. I know that I could sweep. I swept the recitation room three times. Then I got a dusting cloth and I dusted it four times. All the woodwork around the walls, every bench, table and desk, I went over four times with my dusting cloth. Besides, every piece of furniture had been moved and every closet and corner in the room had been thoroughly cleaned. I had the feeling that in a large measure... My future depended upon the impression that I made upon the teacher in the cleaning of that room. When I was through, I reported to the head teacher. She was a Yankee woman who knew just where to look for dirt. She went into the room and inspected the floor and closets. Then she took handkerchief and rubbed it on the woodwork about the walls and over the table and benches. When she was unable to find one bit of dirt on the floor or a particle of dust on any of the furniture, she quietly remarked, I guess you will do to enter this institution. I was one of the happiest souls on the earth. The sweeping of that room was my college examination and never did any youth pass an examination for entrance into Harvard or Yale that gave him more genuine.